Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Autumn 2021 Open Lectures brought to you by the University of York. I'm Dr. Remy Adekoya from the Department of Politics, and I'm here this evening as an academic with a research interest in race, the politics and emotions around identity, and developmental issues affecting Africa. The future of race relations is clearly one of the most important issues we face going forward this 21st century. We are very pleased to be hosting this fascinating and timely event, and thank you all for joining us online this evening during what has been and continues to be a very challenging landscape for us all. A few technical notes here. Should you have any issues such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. If you're watching live, you'll be able to ask questions of our speaker during his talk or just after his talk using the Q&A button on your screen, and we'll take as many of those as we can at the end. Live captioning is available switched on, and if you would like to switch them off, you can do so via the closed captions or via transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again on YouTube in a few days' time and also share with friends and networks who may be interested. You can also use hashtag York Ideas to join in the conversation on Twitter. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome the distinguished Professor Kane Andrews. Professor Andrews is Professor of Black Studies at Birmingham City University. He also wrote Black to Black, Retelling Black Radicalism for the 21st Century, and Resisting Racism, Race Inequality, and the Black Supplementary School Movement. Kende is editor of the Blackness in Britain book series with Bloomsbury, and he has written opinion pieces for outlets including The Guardian, The Independent, Washington Post, and CNN. He is founder of the Harambe Organization of Black Unity and editor-in-chief of Make It Plain, you can purchase signed book plate copies of Kane Day's book from Fox Lane Books Online, and you should see the link appear in the chat box shortly. I'll be back after Kane Day has talked to take some questions from the audience, so please do add your questions to the Q&A box. And now, without further ado, Professor Kane Day Andrews, it is our great pleasure to welcome you. Over to you. All right, good evening. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the introduction as well. Uh, happy to be here virtually, be here, I guess. Um, I guess we're all getting used to Zoom at this point. Uh, so I, I, I've got some slides I'm gonna show you. They're basically just pictures. Uh, but before that, I just, I guess we should, we should recognize the moment that we're in. It is Black History Month or Black Employment Month as, as many, many of us call it. And you know, I'll be honest, I was, I, I'm very skeptical of Black History Month generally mostly because of the practice of it, I guess, rather than the, the idea. But the intention behind Black History Month is really important. You know, it comes out of uh, Carter G. Woodson in the United States in 1926, starts Negro History Week. And the, the purpose behind this really is because at this point in America, they are terrified, African-Americans are terrified of genocide, right? You have to imagine that African-Americans were taken over to the United States because of slavery, because of labor, um, you know, the, after slavery ends, that labor isn't as necessary. By the 20s, um, there's been, you know, changes, uh, mechanization, the way that cotton is produced, et cetera, et cetera. Um, overseas uh, production of cotton has meant that, you know, that labor isn't really as necessary. And so because of the deeply held racial stereotypes uh, that really saw us more as beasts, not really human being, uh, because of lynchings, mass lynchings in America, or up to, up to 10,000 people were lynched in a 40 year period. There was a real worry that actually the, the logical step to deal with African-Americans was, was, was genocide. And so there's quite a G basically says, look, we need to have this, this, this week to remind people that we are actually human beings. There's so much of the, the rhetoric around this is that we're not human beings, right? And in a very real, and there's a quote where he says, the most important anti-lynching movement is, is this movement, this education movement, because if you can, that literally explain to people that we're humans, then they'll be much less likely to kill us, which really kind of, get, kind of gets to the, the, the dark heart of what racism is. Right? When we think about racism, all too often we think about individual prejudice. Um, I don't, you know, people don't like black and brown people. It's, it's more than that, right? There is something systemic to it, something deeply rooted into uh, both the political and economic system, but also the, the, the very simple ideas that we have um, about society. And so something like Black History Month, it comes in the UK in 80, 87, not over fears of genocide, but over similar fears, right? The fears that uh, 
because of the way that we're misunderstood, um, that's why we're treated so badly. That's why you can see the way we're treated in schools. Or you, that's why the way we're treated by the police. Um, in fact, if you the, the thing that sparked the Black Lives Matter protest last last year, the Black Lives Matter summer, if you like, was the murder of George Floyd. And there's no real way to explain that murder of George Floyd without the stereotypes around Black people as being more animalistic, being more brutes, being needed to be controlled. And this explains why Black people are more likely to be killed by the police in the United States and also in the UK, about three times overrepresented in the figures of people who die at the hands of police contact under suspicious circumstances, right? Those, those ideas are still deeply entrenched with us and racism really is a matter of life and death. So as much as I dis have a lot of dis dislike and disdain for the way that Black History Month is practiced, uh, the, the idea of it's really important because it's a reminder that actually there are those are the ideas about us are such an important way to understand how racism is enacted, is played out today. And those ideas are a matter of life and death. So it's really important that we take any opportunity we can to kind of shift that narrative. All right, that was kind of the intro um, into it, I guess, given the month. Uh, I have some slides, talk br broadly about some of the, some of the issues. Um, what are the key, what are some of the key tools, I guess. I wrote this, this book, The New Age of Empire, How Racism and Colonialism Still Rule the World, uh, because it seemed important uh, for, for a number of reasons. I mean, the, the main reason why it, it, it was important, in fact, to write the book, um, I found was that because it just had deeply misunderstood the problem of racism is, right? So when we think, as I was saying before, when we think about racism, we tend to have this, this view of individual prejudice. I mean, this is the way that is generally understood. The legal frameworks that we have for individual prejudice uh, is kind of the way that we understand racism, right? And so the way that we measure racism is by acts of individual prejudice. And there's no doubt that individual prejudice has declined um, over the last 40 years. I mean, if you got me and Remy uh, here, this just wouldn't have happened. I mean, this is pretty unlikely now, actually, given I can give you all the statistics. Uh, the fact that I'm a professor is deeply unlikely now, but 20 years ago, almost like less, less, less likely, 40 years ago, forget about it completely, this would have been uh, not possible, right? So the over expression of racism has certainly declined. If you think about my mom's generation, you know, mom just grew up being called the N-word all the time, chased by racists, this kind of things. I grew up hearing the N-word in music. I have no real, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't invoke particularly negative things that I hear it because of that, right? Because that we kind of outlawed the over expression of racism. So because of this, we can get this impression that things have fundamentally changed, fundamentally shifted, right? This is a com this is a comment from the Guardian, um, uh, Boris Johnson's approach to the Black Lives Matter protest, right? Black lives have never had it so good, because there is this idea that because the individual prejudice has declined, uh, we're in a better place, right? And the other thing that individual individual prejudice declining has meant that people who are in a slightly better position are able to have have more access to things like jobs, et cetera, et cetera. If you think about it in the UK, and not just in the UK, the US certainly, more broadly around the world, the biggest shift that's happened is previously, in the last, say, 50 years ago, there were, were either laws that allowed direct discrimination or there were no laws that prevented direct discrimination. So in the UK, there wasn't actually a law that said you could be racist, but there was no law saying you couldn't be racist. So it was perfectly... Uh, possible to say I'm not going to hire you because you're black, etc. Now, because that shifts after the racial relations legislations, etc., um, and because we understand that over expressions of racial prejudice are problematic, that's created a space for people like myself, lucky enough, get into jobs, get into work. This is great, um, and you can you can find people like me across different industries, and you can say, well, look, is, hasn't things changed? Haven't things got better? In fact, the government's a perfect example, right? This is the most diverse government in the history of, of the UK. However, the government is also a perfect example of the problem with this, right? It may be the most diverse government in the history of the UK. It is also certainly without doubt the most racist government in my lifetime, um, and probably going back a bit, <laughs> I would suggest, if you look at immigration policy, if you look at the policing bill that's about to go through the courts, I mean, this is some really draconian, devastating stuff. <laughs> the policing bill will probably make the protests, large aspects of the protest last summer, um, illegal, right? The immigration legislation, I mean, that most, uh, my parents wouldn't have been here, I wouldn't be in the country 
most people who are black and brown wouldn't be in the country in the future, given the immigration legislation that's coming in uh, now. And you know, the, 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 the best symbol of the problem of the, of the moment is that who is the Home Secretary bringing through this clearly uh, racist policy, is Preeti Patel, the first um, Asian woman, certainly the first Asian woman as Home Secretary. Um, so you have this, I, this one hand, this is the idea of progress, we have representation, on the other hand, it's really taking away all of that because it is the it is some really draconian stuff that is happening. Um, so I mean, this is this is why I wrote the book was to say, well, actually, let's look at how do we measure what racism is, how do you measure racial progress, how do we measure where where we are, where we've been, where we've gone, what was. And my basic argument for the book is that nothing's really new. So none of that is new. It may look a bit different, it may feel a bit different because of lots of things, but there's nothing new here. It's just a continuation of the same in slightly different clothes. The diversity thing, though, actually isn't new at all. Uh, the British Empire could not have lasted, could not have run, could not have functioned without many, 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 many black and brown people in the colonies facilitating that happen. Right? The example I usually give given this talk is um, the Amritsar massacre, the an anniversary is coming up, or I don't know, the anniversary is passed, I think, um, where one of the, the trustees in India, where the British government, uh, the British, sorry, the British army in India opened fire and killed uh, women and children, hundreds of people dead, really terrible, terrible, terrible day of bloodshed in India. But the British army in India was two thirds Indian. In fact, the, the Amritsar massacre, uh, a good number of the soldiers shooting the guns were, were Indian, right? This, this was, this has always been the case that the empire, the face of empire, the facilitation of the empire has been diverse. So when we have a look at our, the cabinet and say, well, look, it's diverse, but it's still perpetuating empire. We shouldn't really be surprised. And, and this is really what the book is about, trying to say, look, let's see what we are now. Let's see how little things have actually changed. Let's see how these patterns are repeated. And if we understand history correctly, we'll understand uh, quite fundamentally that, that we haven't made as much progress as we'd like to think. Um, and as an example of diversity, not meaning progress, the race commission would be the perfect example of this, but this is where we are. And, and, and in many ways, like it's, it's probably predictable. I think I probably would have predicted this. I think I probably did predict this last summer was that what happens when you have a wave of attention on race isn't necessarily good, right? There's, there's a wave of attention. It, it looks like we're doing something different. There's, oh, look, we're gonna have this transformative moment, et cetera. But that wave crests relatively quickly and then it comes crashing down very, very hard and very, very fundamentally. And where we are now in the UK in particular, but I'd say generally around the world, is probably in a worse position now than we were previously in terms of racial relations, because the backlash has been severe, right? So you have this moment of talking about race, and then you have the response, and the government response, certainly in terms of governmental racial relations, we are definitely, undoubtedly, far worse today than we were last year, and I'd say probably far worse since the 90s, probably, if you actually look at the, the rhetoric. You know, the sewer report or the sewage report, as many people are calling it, um, really goes through, it does this sleight of hand, which is uh, a sleight of hand, which shows you, really, if you look through the report, you can see all of the racial inequalities very, very clearly. Education, health, housing, et cetera. So you can just see they're very, they, they actually point them out, put them in graph and stuff like that. But rather than seeing these as racial inequalities, they, they call them racial disparities. This is a term that actually started in, um, uh, under Theresa May's uh, racial view. Uh, 2017, I want to say, 2017, uh, where these become race disparities, not just evidence of racism, this is disparities. And then these disparities, uh, which are blatantly obvious, get explained away in many, in a myriad of ways. So it starts being about race, it's, it's about class, or it's, or it's about geography, where you live, or it's about um, your culture, which is the most clearly openly racist, cultural racism was something I thought we'd abandoned before, but obviously not. Um, so you take the, you look at the clear evidence of race, racism, and then we say there's actually something else. And this, this, is, this is the delusion, the distortions that we do now um, to, to essentially mask uh, the problems of racism. And for the government, this government to be, to be in the point now where we are denying the existence of institutional racism, which to be honest was a pretty settled idea, and I could critique what institutional racism means from the government, because it's usually terrible anyway, but the idea that there are institutional racist practices in police, education, et cetera, was basically settled in all of the literature debates in the government. To take that back really is quite a major step backwards and actually has had quite a lot of impact in terms of things like the Equality and Human Rights Commission don't use the term institutional racism. Um, a lot of the reports coming out now don't use the term institutional racism because the government has said, look, this is, this is, this is not a term that we're going to address. And it, it, it really is problematic. 
So we're in a, definitely in a worse place now than we were before last year, which is problematic. So we need to shift. Essentially, we need to fundamentally shift how we understand the problem, how we understand the issues, how we understand everything. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an example. I think this is quite a nice example because it, it, it kind of gets to the point, right? If there's, I can start, I can really start with any statistic in the UK, but this one is a good one because it, it also gets the class issue as well. So if you look at UK income distribution after housing costs by ethnicity, you can see very clearly that uh, in the bottom, quint bottom quintile, 38% uh, of black families are in the bottom quintile, right? Um, compared to only 7% in the top income quintile, right? Now you go down to white British, it's basically flipping this completely, 17%, only 17% are in the bottom income quintile and 21% are in the top income, income quintile, um, Asian and mixed are in between, yeah? What that's telling you is very clear. This is one of the, the key ways that racism functions, right? Have, if you have less money, you are going to do less well. Now, what is often said, used to say, and actually used in the sewer report around this and a lot of the rhetoric from the government afterwards, is to say, well, this is really about class. Actually, this is a class issue, not a race issue. But I would challenge anybody to explain why it is that 38% of black families are in the, the bottom income uh, quintile as opposed to only 7% in the top income quintile. Like, what, why does that happen? That doesn't just happen accidentally, that happens because of race. It happens because of inequalities in the um, employment market, in the education system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in fact, if you look at youth unemployment, black youth unemployment, it's actually as bad today, black male youth unemployment in particular, is as bad today as it was in 1980. I guess it actually got any better at all. 40% after, um, after the crisis, after the pandemic, 40% black male youth unemployment. Um, in fact, if you actually look at the stats, they declined heavily uh, after the pandemic, but the, it was so bad that the black youth unemployment rate prior to the pandemic was actually twice as bad as the white youth unemployment rate after the pandemic. I mean, this is how intractable this problem is. And this is a problem, as I said, same as 1980, hasn't really shifted at all. So when you're trying to explain why is it what, why, what, what, why is it that we're so much more likely to be in the working class, you can't really explain that with that race. So anybody that comes with the well, it's actually about class, you're missing the point completely. There's a reason we're more likely to be in the working class. The other aspect you often get with that is geography. Geography has become this big thing. Where do you live? Do you live in a city area? Massively important, massively important to your chances of catching COVID actually, high viral load, what kind of work you're doing, uh, income inequality, also hugely important in terms of health inequalities um, uh, and health inequalities in an area we really haven't talked about enough. I mean, one of the stats I could have used here would have been that black women are about four times more likely to die in childbirth. Again, a stat that hasn't improved. If you went back 50 years, you would find that very same distinction. And actually, in fact, the if you think about the term institutional racism, where it comes from is not the, the McPherson report. It is uh, Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton's book, Black Power. And the example they give of institutional racism is the fact that black women in the US in the 1960s were four times more likely to die in childbirth in the 60s. So this literally has not improved if you look at the stats in America and you look at the stats here. And what they're saying with institutional racism is it is about everything. It's about where you live. It's about how you live. It's about the work that you can do. It's about the educational opportunities. It's about the income you have in your house. It's about all of these things produces these kind of inequalities where we are more likely to be in the working class, we are more likely to have health inequalities, we are more likely, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and so this is how we should be understanding the problem. If you look at all these disparities, um, criminal justice, uh, where half of all young people in, incarcerated uh, presently in the UK are from an ethnic minority, half, I mean, just imagine how bad that is. Uh, if you look at stop and search, all this stuff, all those are not disparities. Those are evidence, really quite clear evidence of racism. That's what racism looks like. And it actually affects people's life, right? It actually, it actually shortens your life chances. You're more likely to be murdered if you're black in the UK. You're more likely to die early if you're black in the UK. It's actually quite stark. And this is the kind of way we should be talking about racism, not am I likely to be called the N-word on the boss. This isn't actually a good measure of racism or not, right? And if you look at the key mechanisms of racism in the UK, they haven't really improved as much as we'd like to think. In fact, they barely improved at all. The other area where you can see this, and I, this, I went to a school, a grammar school in Portsmouth yesterday, and I showed this, and I was like, well, look, this is a map of the world uh, wealth, in a, so this is global wealth inequality, basically. So the darker green countries are the richest, uh, the deeper red countries are the poorest, and the other co colors in between are 
uh, in in between somewhere, right? Now, I showed this map to what was the youngest kids, I think were year 10, year 10, year, year 10, was that 14, 14, 15? And you show the map and say, well, what, what do all the great dark green colors have in common? And it was pretty obvious. They all said, look, this is the countries which are predominantly white countries, right? America, Canada, Australia, uh, Western Europe. Uh, the only real different outlier is uh, Japan, right? And I guess South Korea now as well in the in the, the what we call the West. But generally, the countries with the white people living with predominantly are the dark green countries or the light green countries, right? And then when you look at the countries which are what's the poorest part of the world, very obvious, leaps out of the map straight away, it is Africa, right? So what so-called sub-Saharan Africa is the poorest part of the world, right? And there is a hierarchy in between. Now, a bunch of 15-year-olds saw this straight away. They were really obvious, like you can't really miss it. And so if we're looking at global inequality, the way that we should be, must have to talk about this would be about, would be racism, right? White supremacy. And this is a pretty clear this, this, um, this uh, demonstration of white supremacy, white on the top, black at the bottom, everyone else in between. However, we don't have a method when we actually talk about global inequality, we very rarely talk about race, which is kind of crazy, given it is the most blatantly obvious, blindingly obvious feature of a map of global inequality that a bunch of 15 year olds can pick out instantaneously. So there's something that's going wrong, uh, deeply wrong, in how we're understanding the world. Uh, the late philosopher Charles Mills called this an epistemology of ignorance. And that's, that's the, probably the politest, thing, the politest thing you could say. You would have to actually be ignoring history um, to, to not recognize this. Now, somebody rec recommended a book to me the other day, uh, Why Nations Fail. I mean, gee, if anybody read that book, why, a very popular book, Why Nations Fail, so, uh, manages to talk about, it's like, I was audio listening to this, it was 18 hours, talks about, you know, why, why some countries rich, why some countries poor. I don't think it mentioned the word, did it mention the word racism once? I don't think so. There was kind of an empire was important, sort of mentioned slavery, but managed to explain global inequality without the blindingly obvious truth that this is about racism. And just as a matter of, just to make this really, the case of racism is a matter of life and death. If you are in one of these highly uh, uh, under, underdeveloped countries, your life expectancy is massively reduced. I mean, it's so reduced that you can't really compare people in the West to people outside of the West. It doesn't even make any sense, right? The poorest person in the West is in the top, at least 85% of the world, top of the world's earners. Um, the, most people in the world don't have an indoor toilet. Uh, a child dies every second because every 10 seconds because they haven't got access to food. Nine million people die every year from hunger. I mean, literally more people died last year from hunger than died from COVID-19 or will die from COVID-19 at all. We didn't have this massive panic, global panic emergency about how to save them because they're black and brown people and they're just not that bothered, right? That's the way the economy functions, where black and brown people just die by the million because of poverty, uh, are exploited to make, you know, to make the products have, so we can have this, actually, if you looked at how, how are we able to have this technological advancement in the West, it is because, you know, Africa should be the richest country in the planet, has the most mineral wealth, has the richest farmland, should by any mechanism be the richest, but actually is the poorest continent on the planet because that wealth is extracted out. I mean, that's racism. There's nothing more you can say to that. And then you look at the conditions in somewhere like India, which India and even China to a large extent often given as these massive as areas of progress, but both of those countries depend on 400 million dirt poor people uh, doing the work and the labor that, that kind of enriches the rest, right? And actually, if you look at both India and China, they're not as rich as they should be, right? I mean, China and India's economies are will shortly be a lot, maybe the lot China might be the largest shortly, India's shortly soon after, but they have a, over a billion people. They're supposed to have big economies. Um, if you actually do a, a GDP per capita, India is very poor and China is pretty poor too, right? So this isn't wealth that's being, that's being distributed out equally to the population. Anyway, so we think about this map. I go back to this, but I think this is important. Visual tool, white at the top, black at the bottom, everywhere else in between. Where can we see these um, ideas? We can see these ideas very clearly in scientific racism from the 18th century, right? So this is uh, Linnaeus. Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist who uh, did a whole book, Systema Natura. I probably pronounced it wrong because I Latin is that most wrong point. And he basically categorized all the plants. And as he was doing that, he categorized um, human beings. And he put human beings into these following categories. At the top was Europaeus albus, uh, 
ingenious, white, sanguine, governed by law. A uh, step down was America's hibiscus, happy with his luck, liberty-loving, liberty uh, tanned and irascible, governed by custom. Another step down was Asiatic luridus, yellow, melancholy, governed by opinion. And then at the bottom, there was Afro Niger, crafty, lazy, black, governed by the arbitrary will of the master, right? White at the top, black at the bottom, and everyone else in between. This is the hierarchy of white supremacy. If you go through any of the so-called great thinkers that we still teach in universities, I mean, I work in university, this is a university thing, right? Like Emmanuel Kant, Locke, Rousseau, all of them, Voltaire, all of them had some racial theory that looked like this. The middle bits often were moved around in terms of who was higher and who was lower. But in general, white at the top, black at the bottom, everyone else in between, this hierarchy of white supremacy was broadly accepted by all of the key philosophers, right? this architecture of racism. And it cannot surely be a coincidence that the world that exists, that has been created off the same ideas, theories uh, of, of the world and universal rights, et cetera, yada, 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 looks like this. This is not accidental that this has produced this. This is by design, right? The world is meant to look like this. And it is also not accidental that we have essentially forgotten <laughs> that racism or ignored that racism is the underlying thing which has produced this deeply unequal uh, global system. Now I'm saying racism is a matter of life and death. That, that's what I mean. Those ideas are so important because they create a world that kills black and brown people by the millions. Not, and this is not in the past, this is in the present. This is today. Really important, this isn't change. Empire is not, it, it, it looks different. This is why I call it the new age of empire, but it is fundamentally the same system, the same logic. You can, you can exploit black and brown people to enrich white people, and this is the way the world goes around. And this is the way the capital, capitalist world has gone around and around and around. Um, just to give you an idea of how deeply seated these um, concepts of white supremacy are, Claude Linnaeus, who, you know, I, I would have thought maybe we'd have, we'd have had a, you talk about canceling people, <laughs> I'm not sure canceling Linnaeus is the right word, but maybe you don't venerate them, right? Linnaeus has a university in Sweden currently named after him. You can do trips over to uh, Linnaeus University, et cetera, et cetera, to do your degree there. And, and this is a picture of me on Newsnight uh, in, nine, in uh, 2017, I think it was, talking about um, SOAS, School of African, Oriental and African Studies, who had the temerity to suggest that the union should actually, you know, think about some African and Asian philosophers, right? Seems like it would be a logical thing to do in a school of Oriental and African Studies. This caused a massive uproar. This is actually from the Daily Express newspaper, um, <laughs> who have graced uh, a number of times. And this is the I bring this up. It's the one time that I was uh, trending on Twitter was when I just suggested that Emmanuel Kant, who's pictured next to me here, Emmanuel Kant was a racist. I mean, that as though that was controversial. Emmanuel Kant was was clearly a racist. I mean, there's one thing you you couldn't. Uh, Emmanuel Kant would have said that Emmanuel Kant was a racist. And Immanuel Kant spent so much time, so much of his actual body of work was just building this really spurious, what he called moral geography, uh, that basically explained why Africans were inferior, why white people were superior, et cetera, et cetera. It is the, the white race that has all the talents, et cetera. And Immanuel Kant was clearly obviously racist. Kant, and, and, and when I wrote the book, I knew he was racist, but didn't know the detail. And, and the devil is in the detail, as I say. And he was so racist, he actually, at one point, was advising slave masters of how to best beat Africans based on his dubious uh, theory. He basically thought our skin was too thick to use a whip and said you should use a split bamboo cane because that would get the blood out of us. This is Emmanuel Kent. Emmanuel Kent was a racist. There is no doubt about it that Emmanuel Kent was a racist. Go read some Kent, you'll find out very, 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 very quickly. But when I said this on TV, it became this big thing. I mean, A, I didn't even know most people were aware who Emmanuel Kent was. That, so that was quite surprising. But two, it just shows the ignorance that we have of, the, of these figures. But the more important part of this is, yes, Emmanuel Kant was racist, obviously. The defense typically of Kant, someone like Kant or Voltaire, uh, Rousseau, et cetera, et cetera, is that yes, they were racist, but you can separate their racism from their theory. And you just can't, right? You really can't. That's such a backwards idea. And actually Kant himself says that, he says he makes a big, a, a specific point where he says, you cannot separate my moral geography racial science, white, uh, white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera, from my moral theory, because what he's saying is that the reason that Kant could know about 
human rights and all this stuff that we like love can for a pure reason etc etc is because he is white it is because he is white that he has the authority to to, to to give this universal reason whiteness is deeply embedded in the very structure of the idea of Kant's critique of pure reason. It is the basis of it, in fact, it is the basis of the critique of pure reason. You can't take it out and pretend it's not there, because it is the whole thing is there, right? And so what you get is a framework of rights which solidifies white supremacy in a very real way. So one other thing that uh, Kant often gets defended on is towards the end of his life, he kind of came out against slavery, after slavery ended, by the way, came out against colonialism, uh, said that people had the right to, to rule themselves, and this is often given as a, as, a, as a really good example of Kant becoming anti-racist. Utter nonsense. I mean, literally, a couple of years before he dies, he's still spew, spewing out the same racial theory. What he basically comes to the, 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 the awareness of is that, yeah, we have some rights, right? We have, black people should have some rights, but he does not say that black people should have all rights. and certainly not full of human rights in any meaningful way at all. In fact, if you actually look at what Kant is saying, it's very similar to me saying, look, a gorilla should have the right. A gorilla shouldn't be poached. A gorilla should have the right to the habitat. We shouldn't be chopping down gorillas for no reason. Let the gorillas live and roam. That's essentially what Kant is saying. You have the right to life, and that is it. And think about the key thing, and, and right, Kant really is the underpinning of the human rights framework. That right to life is what we, the, the fundamental thing of the UN Charter, the right to life, the right to life, the right to life. The right to life does not guarantee you the right to prosperity. It's not guarantee the right to full humanship. It just guarantees you the right to be alive, right? And that's the fundamental problem. So what we've essentially done is created a world because of colonialism, empire, slavery, et cetera, created a world with this gross inequality. Africa at the point where Kant is theorizing is already underdeveloped and becomes further underdeveloped. Um, and then where Europe is in the, in the ascendancy at this point, right, is becoming the top, et cetera, et cetera. We create a world that has all these stark inequalities. And then actually the framework of human rights that guarantees you the right to life and little else then freezes us in that moment, right? It says you don't have the right to your wealth back. You don't have the right to equality of life, equality of outcome. No, no, you just have the right to live in the conditions which we have created for you, which we have decided are best for you, right? But this whole framework is deeply rooted in racism. And this is a, a major reason why we can't get anywhere because we can't acknowledge the, 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 the whiteness that is fundamental in all the international institutions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I was gonna do some I was going to go and do a bit of Columbus, a Columbus bashing, but I, I, I'm not going to the time purposes, but just to say Columbus is terrible, but also Columbus is quite a good re representation of the West, because if you think about what makes the West the West, what really defines the West, what really opens up the West and all this stuff, the boundary that we have now, the industrial revolution, the scientific revolution, the political revolution, is based on this moment where Columbus goes over to to the east finds doesn't discover anything finds the americas and that unlocks everything else at this point in 1492 europe is behind europe is europe may be the only place in the world in the dark age it's behind everywhere it's behind africa it's behind asia it's behind it's south america it's behind it's behind um, it is the americas and the atlantic system which allows europe to develop right because it slavery those key com commodities what are the key commodities of european development First, it's gold and it's silver. Where do they come from? They come from the Americas. Then it's cotton. Then it's tobacco, sugar, cotton. Where are they grown? In the Americas. Uh, and it's the wealth from those things which allow the rest to happen. It unlocks everything. Slavery, a 300-year system of taking Africans and, and, and turning them into commodities to produce these commodities and then sold and become the bedrock of everything. The Atlantic system, without that, there is not what we have now just simply doesn't exist. Couldn't exist. Britain couldn't have colonized the world that is well from the Atlantic system. In fact, even the book, When Nations Fail, acknowledges this. They just call it the Atlantic trade, need to ignore slavery, et cetera, et cetera. But it is, that Atlantic, it is that movement to the West, which is the fundamental thing which allows everything else to happen. So Columbus is the most celebrated person, certainly like the country named after him, the capital, the, the capital of the United States is named after him. And, it is mad. and Columbus, it didn't go to America or most places in the United States. I mean, it didn't go to the United States, he didn't go to most parts of, of Latin America, but he's um, the most celebrated figure there. He's the right person to celebrate, right? Because he actually is the, the person that opens the door. He's also Europe's first slave trader. He's also someone who uh, kicked off the largest genocide in human history. Um, he is also someone who actually went around the island with man-eating dogs, hunting down the native Taino. He's a terrible, uh, terrible, you couldn't find the much worse person in history, but he's also the perfect person to celebrate 
of the West because he, he is the one that represents what the West is more than anyone else. And that really is the, the, the tragedy of the West. That's, that's why we have this epistemology of ignorance because it's the kind of thing you want to forget, right? Your hero's hands are, are, are completely and utterly soaked in blood. I'm going to skip over this. And okay. yes, so I'm going to just briefly end on this. And I think this, this, this kind of movement from the old empire to the new empire is really is quite important in capturing. It. So what happens, you know, this is the British, the British empire at its height, 24% of the world, 24% of the world population, massive, 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 hundreds of millions of people, stripping resources, wealth, et cetera, et cetera, out from, from various parts of the world to bring, into, to bring into the UK. Now, what we typically think of with empire is the empire ended when the British Empire ended, the French Empire ended, and, 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 it, and it collapsed. What basically happens is that these ways of empire can't hold anymore after the Second World War in particular. One, for many reasons, the Second World War is an, is, a, is, an, is an empire war. First World War is very started by empires, it's empires butting heads. Uh, the Second World War follows on from the First World War. So you can make an argument actually that the, what, there is this competition between the different European empires and that competition kind of tips us into the Second World War eventually, right? And that devastates Europe, devastates the coffers, the money. They just don't have the, the resources anymore to, 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 to maintain hold of the empire. The other part of that is that during both the Second World War and the First World War, these were world wars. So you needed to arm people and to give people in the colonies, oh, millions of people died in Asia and Africa, et cetera, fighting. And they're not going to put down their arms afterwards. They want independence. They want nationalism. They want independence. They're fighting. And Europe can't hold this anymore. So what they do, and there's a quote from Malcolm X, where he says that, you know, uh, the European empires are basically trapped. They're trapped like in basketball. You've got a ball, but you're trapped. You can't, you can't move. You can't go anywhere. And so what they do is they pass the ball over to America. And America, remember, is just Europe on steroids. It is a place where Europeans, where various different Europeans went, created the largest, like this massive genocide, uh, created the state of, of a fundamentally undistilled racism uh, based on slavery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And America is becoming deeply rich because of this. It's not a surprise America is rich because of this. It is, America, like I said, Europe on steroids. And so after the Second World War, it takes its place at the head of the empire, runs the empire, but presents this benevolent, colonial, benevolent colonialism. This is what Malcolm X did. He said, look, European empires are done. They're dead. They're over. We're not going to support them so much. Um, although America does do lots of violence, like we can pretend America didn't do violence. America does a lot of violence around the world, but generally transitions into this thing where you have things like the UN, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, all based in America, not coincidentally, right? That sets a new agenda and says, well, look, we're, we're going to deliver it. We're going to let you have your freedom, let you have your political independence, let you have your nation state, but we're going to control the purse strings. We're going to control the economy. So what basically happens is you have this transition into this benevolent imperialism where the West and places like the UN, the US, uh, USA, UK aid pretend to be friends, right? They're offering out money, they're offering out loans, but only on the basis that, that ties uh, the former colonies deeply into this economic system which oppresses them. This is why you can explain 50 years after independence that poverty is still there. 50 years after independence, the economic relationships in Africa, in Asia, et cetera, are still the same. They're still deeply exploitative where the wealth is being shifted out uh, to Europe. But people feel better, people feel more uh, empowered, right? Um, and it doesn't have, and, and, and oftentimes, I mean, there is, like I said, it's underpinned by violence, but isn't always violent. So it feels different, but actually it isn't different. It's exactly the same. Uh, and this is, this is the greatest trick the devil ever pulled, right? It's, it's convincing the world it doesn't exist. And so when we're thinking about the UN, and the UN has the best reputation of all of these things, I would say. Um, the, the one that looks at global inequality, et cetera, et cetera, but doesn't say, we'll talk about white supremacy, doesn't talk about histories of colonialism, doesn't talk about racism. This is the reason why, because the UN, just like anything else, is facilitating the exploitation of the black and brown world through unfair trade practices, through the way that uh, capital flows work, et cetera, et cetera, but present, pre presenting this veneer of benevolence, right, of aid, of charity, we're trying to help, but all the time in a system which is deeply unbalanced and deeply set against uh, the black and brown. So if we are going to think about racism, talk about racism, the only way is to really understand that it is rooted deeply in our economic systems and that we have to at least firstly talk about it, address it, but uh, address the damage that has been done, address where we are, and address you know the, the, the most obvious and ever, ever, the most obvious form of white supremacy, which is global global the global 
global economy, and then how that also plays out in national systems that we have in the West, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, I think I'm gonna stop because I don't wanna go on for too long. I'm gonna let, uh, let you ask uh, any questions uh, that, you, that you have. Okay, thanks a lot for that fascinating talk. I'd have a couple of questions I'd love to ask, but there's questions come here from the audience, so, so I'll go with them first, and then maybe if there's time, uh, we'll be able to still have an exchange and, uh, towards the end. So first, there's a question here from George. <clears throat> says uh, Boris Johnson says his leveling up agenda will help tackle racism and inequality by ensuring everyone has the same opportunities. But is this colorblind approach futile or worse damaging? Um, it's definitely damaging, uh, but it's definitely on purpose. The leveling up, I mean, you can't address a problem if you don't address the problem, right? You can't just say, like, look, we're going to make everyone richer, so therefore this is going to be better for all of us. All the rising tide raises all boats, right? What that does, and what you've seen here, because, all, I mean, we have black people here, is look, we are in a much better position because we're in the West than if we weren't in the West. That's just fundamentally true, right? Like, my, even the poorest black person here is in a, is a completely different economic system in, in Africa, totally different. But relatively, this is actually the same, right? So if you just make everyone richer, you just keep that same imbalance, right? It doesn't change. More to the point, I mean, leveling up is predominantly aimed at the North. If you look at the North, we're not really in the North. Right? Most black people live in, live, in, live in London. London, Birmingham, I guess Manchester, but we're not tend to be that Northern, right? And that whole leveling up agenda and the North, et cetera, is so, just listen to the rest of the rhetoric, it's white working class, white working class, we're gonna help the white working class. There, it is it is nonsensical to suggest that you can deal with the issue of racism just by dealing with the issue of poverty. It's not how that it's not how that works. Certainly, it would benefit some people. Definitely, it's not a bad thing. You should, but it's like a bit like social democracy, a bit like Corbynism, right? Like social democracy is, is a good idea. Social democracy will mean you have less black people in poverty, no doubt about it. Um, but that doesn't deal with the race issue. When my family came to this country under social democracy, it was terrible, right? And it's terrible there. So no, the idea you can pretend that you just fix the class problem, the race problem, we know that's not true. There is no evidence historically to suggest that that's a, that's a good approach. Okay, uh, thanks for that. And from Gillian, simple, but I think um, a pretty important question. She says, what do you believe is the best way to help educate people on racism? <laughs> I don't know. I don't mean, <laughs> um, it's a good question. So what's the yeah. I think one is to be honest and to be and, and not to not to avoid. So this is one thing that does happen is we we, we like to sometimes what's the sugarcoat might not be the right word, but we don't want to be too controversial. We want to keep people with us, so we don't want to just go for the make it plain, right? But actually, no, we have to just be very clear about what the stakes are, about what this is um really push home those kind of things like actually you know the child dies every 10 seconds because they can't because they can't eat that's racism right that's since i started to now that's hundreds of dead kids right that's what we're actually talking about and this should be a conversation that we're uncomfortable in like if you're talking about race and we're not uncomfortable there's a problem <laughs> this isn't like a happy cheery conversation this is a deeply disturbing reality that leads to dead children like and, uh, and we should put it like that because i think that's important to kind of disturb people in fact the book i've just finished writing it's called the psychosis of whiteness. And I use that on purpose to say, look, we, start, we need to stop trying to be too nice about these things. Whiteness, that, that idea that you can think about the world in non-racial terms, think about global inequality in non-racial terms. How could you describe that in any other way other than a psychosis? It's totally and utterly deluded. I mean, it's so irrational and removed from all kind of just reasonable ways of understanding the world. There's no other way to think about it, right? And so, that's what I try to do. I was trying to push it because I think you have to make that uncomfortable. And I think that's a starting point. I don't think that's an end point. But I, I do see a lot of a lot of work that's coming out now. It's trying to make people feel comfortable with white supremacy. Like there's a book literally called Me and White Supremacy, where you can do a 28-day reflexive journal about your white supremacy as though this is somehow supposed to help. That's the wrong way to do it. The right way to do it is to at least try and make people uncomfortable with the reality and hope that from that discomfort. Uh, you can get something generative, I think. Okay, thanks. Um, Gary here, I think pretty much um, uh, agreeing with you on a thing, but perhaps you'd want to comment on this. He says you can see similar contradictions in the behavior of William Wilberforce, uh, 
who, despite his work in parliament to end the transatlantic slave trade, viewed black people as inferior to white and needing a particular form of control to enable them to take part in quote unquote civilized society. Some people have argued that he was a quote unquote man of his times and should not be judged too harshly. What is your response to this view? Well, the, the, the Haitian revolutionaries, people like uh, Cecil Fatiman, uh, Desai, they were all around at the same time. They didn't believe that, right? They, they, they liberated themselves and said, look, we're fully human. So the man of the time thing is nonsense. Like, there were plenty of people, mostly black people, who very fully understood that they were human and they just weren't believed. And I think the Wilberforce thing, and abolition more generally, is just, you can be anti race you can be anti well, you can be anti-racist and be racist. Yeah, you can be anti-racist and actually be racist, right? Like, this is this is this is that this is how this is why I use the term psychology. It makes no sense. But like, if you actually look at so much of the abolition campaign, it was saying, look, yeah, you shouldn't do slavery. Slavery is bad. But they weren't saying black people were fully human beings. They weren't saying we should have full rights. In fact, um, in America after the after, after emancipation, the kind even the president um, uh, Lincoln before he was killed was believed that the, sol the solution was, look, yeah, you end slavery and then you should get rid of all African, African Americans. They should all go to somewhere else. And they tried to deport them, like, yeah, go to Haiti, go to Africa. Yeah, there's the, and I think this is also a, an important point for now because you can have this, look, it's, it's, you can believe it's, it's wrong to kill George Floyd and still be racist. Of course you can, right? That's, that's perfectly, you can do that. You can still institutionally carry on racist practices, even if you don't personally think that you were racist. And I think Wilberforce is a good example of that. And why, again, we have to really push this. It's not about your individual attitude. It's about the systems that we reproduce in, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thanks. And then from Nicola, also simple but uh, important. She says, what is the first or most important step we can take in addressing institutional racism in the UK? I guess the first one is to acknowledge it. I mean, I think that, I mean, that is a basic one. I'm so I would hope I wouldn't have to say that, but I do because obviously we're in a moment where that's just not even that's not accepted. I mean, like I said the Equality Human Rights Commission, who was supposed to deal with institutional racism, don't won't use the term institutional racism or structural. They won't use it. Like they actually won't use it. I was I was disinvited from an event at the EHRC by staff members who invited me. They were like, nah, it will be hypocritical for us to invite you because we've just been told that we're doing a review of COVID and what caused COVID. And we're not allowed to use the term institutional racism or structural racism. So we're just, we're just wrong for you. There's no point in you coming because it's just going to fall on deaf ears. I mean, obviously, if you're not even going to accept that it's a problem, you're not going to be able to address it. So I think that's important. It's not enough, though, because you can accept it's a problem and then what next? Uh, the next thing then is to think about outcomes. I mean, I think you really have to think about what are the outcomes of the institution that you are in? What is that? It's not about so diversity isn't. But you can have a diverse institution, which is institutional racism, but like you really can, like you really, really, really can. So diversity, so when we think about how do we solve institutional racism, it isn't diversity. Although at the same time, I could make the argument that diversity is important. Like, yes, you should have more black people, they should be more senior, there's lots of reasons for that, but you have to separate diversity from in, in, in institutional racism. They're different things, they're completely different things. Institutional racism is looking at what are the impacts of the work that you do? What is the, 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 what, are the what are the actual impacts? How does that actually function? If I'm thinking about a university, for example, university sector is a good example where we solved the issue of diversity. No, we actually haven't, but there's more diverse student body. It's still deeply problematic because it's diverse at the bottom end of the league table and not diverse at the top end. This is a good example of institutional racism. But look, um, even if you solve the issue of staffing, which is terrible and professors is awful, you could solve those issues, but actually what's the outcome of the university? What's the what jobs are students getting? Where, where are students coming from, et cetera? So what's the experience of students in the institution? I mean, that's a big thing students have been saying. Look, we're in these, even if you get into the elite institution, our experience is terrible, right? <laughs> the, the curriculum is awful for us. We, we're, we're alienated from it. We're being policed by people within the, within the institution. Uh, therefore, we're not getting good grades. We're not, we're, not, we're not graduating as we should be, right? So even if you fix the diversity issue, you actually have to fix the actual outcomes, right? That's what we're looking at. Is it a place that is, that is conducive for student learning? Is it a place that nurtures? Uh, black students, etc. Is it a place that graduates people? Um, and so take that approach, but take that approach for every every industry. Okay. And then uh, John asks, do you believe positive discrimination is an effective tool in addressing racism? So uh, no, just because, uh, like I said before, I don't think diversity is the same thing as addressing racism. But if you want to address diversity, we have to have positive discrimination. 
right? So if we're saying, look, let's say diversity is important, which I didn't think, I didn't think it is generally the important you should do, then how else are you going to employ people if you don't positively discriminate? Uh, it's, it's the idea you could do it without positive discrimination is frankly insane, to be honest. I mean, take, again, because I know universities very well. I mean, there are, I am one of 150 black professors in the UK. That means that, you know, we're not all allowed to get on a plane together just in case there's an accident and then none of us left, right? Like there's we are 0.6%, like out of 20,000. How on earth are you going to address that problem unless you make an actual effort to positively discriminate? You're not going to, it's not going to be possible. Let's stop pretending. So if we're serious about diversity, then yes, you have to have positive discrimination. But again, I'll warn you that doesn't deal with racism. You could have, you could have a university that has 3% black professors, it would still be institutionally racist if it still does the same things that it currently does, right? Okay. And uh, Sheikh has asked a question, uh, aren't countries poor because they are governed by corrupt leaders? But why are countries governed by corrupt leaders? I mean, no, she says, yeah, yeah, okay, you are answering. I, mean, yeah, okay. I, I accept the corruption is a massive problem, but why are they mm. corrupt leaders? Where do they go and track back all of the corrupt leaders in Africa, certainly, and you will find these are supported by Western governments, like very directly supported. When you talk about corruption in, in Africa, where's the money? It's not African corruption. Where's the money coming from? The West, usually. Where's the money going? The West, usually, right? This is a, not in Africa about this corruption at all. You're always going to find people. We we're going to take the bribes, take the money. Look, if I'm in that, I might take the body. Someone said, look, for example, <laughs> Nigeria. Nigeria. <laughs> was, what was that? You take that a billion dollars, like Nigeria. <laughs> like Jonathan, a billion dollars. A billion dollars in one day. Yeah. Michelle and any said, look, here's a billion dollars. I'm not yeah. sure I could take that a billion dollars. Like, I don't know. I don't know. So yeah. this, this is African corruption. It's European corruption. It's Western corruption. That's in Africa yeah. and Africa. Um, so yeah, no, I agree corruption is a problem, but, and actually there's a whole bit in the book about this. Um, mm. If you actually look at that corruption, that's, that's a Western creation, that is not an African, there's nothing African about that. Mm. Okay, and final question, then I'll just ask that, and uh, Kende, what do you think needs to happen for things to change? <laughs> I mean, look, this is our, I, I, New Age of Empire is a, is a prequel to Back to Black. New Age of Empire is very much, look, what is the problem? Because I think the first thing you have to do is acknowledge there's a problem, acknowledge what the problem is, acknowledge that white supremacy just is the fund fundamental thing that makes this, this society go around. And that's important and we can see it in lots of places. But the, the, it's a prequel to Back to Black because in Back to Black, I put forward a very I, hopefully compelling argument, um, Back to Black, returning Black radicalism to the 21st century. This is actually the only way to really solve this is, is revolution. Like, it's, there's no way to reform it. You can't reform it because all of the institutions, the way that the, the government works, it's just, it's just the problem, right? And the fact that I can point out all these issues and all these inequalities and the fact they haven't really changed over the last 50 years should tell us that these aren't an example the system isn't working. This is the logic of the system. This is what it's supposed to do. This is what it's always done from 1492 to today. So the only way then, if you want a, a truly anti-racist world is to build an alternative, right? And that means actually building an alternative. And I can give you a model for the Black Revolution, which is about Pan African unity, people coming together, et cetera, et cetera. Give a model you want. But the reality is that we have to think about alternatives. And I think that radical imagination is really important because one of the things we've forgotten about is that the way that we go on about now is that this is the only way. There is no alternative. But 50 years ago, it wasn't clear that the West would survive. Like it really wasn't. You had, so you had communism, you had Pan Africanism, you had Latin American struggle. There was, there was, and <laughs> one of the most disturbing books I read recently was uh, The Jakarta Method by, um, I can't remember who's by, Jakarta, The Jakarta Method about what happened in Indonesia. And you talk about the Cold War, like it was just this stalemate between the, the West and, well, it wasn't that at all. What they were basically doing, CIA back, the UK was doing this as well, the UK was involved in Indonesia. They were, they were basically going around getting uh, lead, putting in, installing particular governments and getting rid of different governments who would basically murder communists, <laughs> black and brown communists around the world. Indonesia was a million people got killed. And these lists were written up by the British government and by the CIA, et cetera. But that moment of history that we, we remember as kind of stalemate was actually a moment where the West was really going around and killing millions of people to ensure these revolutions didn't happen. So revolution might sound pie in the sky, in the sky but it really isn't. Like you, we need an alternative and alternatives are possible. And the first thing we have to understand is one, we need the alternative, and two, that that revolution is is a hundred percent possible. 
And if anything, it's, it's 100% necessary because capitalism is going to kill all of us, right? Look at climate change. If we don't do something different, the whole world's going to end. So hopefully that's the impetus for us to radically rethink the future. Okay, thank you for that, Katie. I'm sure many of our attendees will be keen to get hold of a copy of your book. Uh, signed book plate copies are available from Fox Lane Books, and you'll see details of this in the chat box. If you enjoyed this event, you may be interested in another talk we have coming up soon entitled The Devil You Know, in which Dr. Gwen Adsheed, one of Britain's leading forensic psychiatrists, shares the eye-opening insights that she has gained providing therapy to countless violent criminals and calls for greater compassion and shared humanity in the face of complex and emotive psychological issues. We hope some of you can join us for that on Tuesday, 23rd of November at 6.30 p.m. online. All that remains now is to thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Kendia, once for that interesting um, uh, talk and, 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 and your presentation. Please remember that this talk will be available on YouTube in the coming days, and you will receive an email to notify you of that. Thank you again. And that'll be all, folks. All right. Thank you, everybody.